Okay, thank you very much, David. Um, hello, everyone. Um, good to see you again, or talk to you again if you've attended the previous one, and nice to meet you if we've never met. Um, as David said, I work at Warwick Business School, so a bit south of where most of you are based, uh, but I do come to Scotland quite regularly. Um, so my areas of expertise are around strategy implementation, performance management, and innovation. So today we're talking about the one in the middle, if you like, so the more kind of performance measurement, performance management side of things. Um, I'm based at Warwick. I also work uh, with other companies, and um, I've been working in this field for about 15 years, both as an academic and as a practitioner. Um, just to give you a bit of background to us, uh, in this case Warwick, this is me. I photoshopped the picture so you don't see the gray hair. Um, uh, Warwick is based in a, on a campus uh, just south of Coventry. This is our building, but we also have facilities in London. So I'm the course director for the Executive MBA, and the Executive MBA runs at both Warwick and at the Shard in London, quite, quite a fancy venue, I should say. Um, just a couple of things about programs. We run, uh, we'll run a program at, um, in Kenilworth, which is really nearby uh, here, on the 5th to 7th of December. And I'll do this for a company called Interactive Mrs. Events. And it will be on performance management. And we'll do a similar one at, in Sterling uh, from the 25th to the 27th of January. So if you're interested, you could liaise with David, uh, David or myself um, about those programs. Um, Right, so what are we going to do today? Um, the agenda covers a number of points, and um, I'm going to go relatively quickly, but uh, w because I want to leave time for questions and discussion and so on at the end. Um, the first point that I want to touch on in looking at how performance measurement, performance management, and in general, uh, data systems um, help organizations, but also trigger motivation as opposed to demotivation, as unfortunately we've witnessed sometimes in organizations. Uh, the first concept that is quite handy here is the one of alignment. And alignment is there not to say that everybody should do the same, um, nor that everybody should know the corporate jingle, but uh, it's more about getting everybody to be willing uh, to contribute to the same goals uh, in different ways, um, through different types of efforts, from different functions and so on, but it's having that clarity of goals and being committed to them. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Then we'll talk about a typical practice that we can use to try and motivate people. Uh, and if we get it right, uh, target setting can be very positive. If we get it wrong, unfortunately, it demotivates people. So again, it's quite a key one to do. And particularly in the public sector, I've seen that happen many times when you know, we've established targets for a good reason, but they've actually uh, kind of fired back and, uh, and not been really helpful. Um, the third point is really getting into motivation. So I'll make a distinction between two things. This is definitely not a discussion that has to be academic, but uh, the terms are intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. You may be familiar or not with them. I'll make a distinction between the two. One is about something that we want to do because we find it inherently valuable and, uh, and right. And the extrinsic is more about we are motivated because we get something back, something in exchange. It can be money, but it can also be praise. It can be a non-financial reward of any kind. So we'll talk about those. And then I'll end up with another practice that we, most of us have, uh, called performance reviews or PDRs or PDPs or performance appraisals, I mean, whichever way you talk about that, but it tends to be mainly individual reviews of performance. And I'll say a couple of things about how to make those uh, more productive and also more connected to this idea of motivating people as opposed to going through the motions once a year with your line manager. Uh, as I said, I want to leave enough time for uh, questions and answers at the end. Okay, so um, just broadly uh, speaking, you know, the whole idea of motivation and alignment comes from the sense of we need to be familiar and be able to connect to something that is, uh, is a bit abstract, is a bit up there, uh, but something that we could call a mission statement or a vision statement or set of values. I mean, most of us would have something like that, which mainly talks about the aspiration of an organization. So what we would like to create, what we would like the future to be, what are the values that uh, you know we share as an organization, and maybe an organization and its partners, other organizations, but also service users. And those, as organizations, what we try to do, we try to then put them a bit more into practice by defining strategic goals, objectives, and uh, you know strategic plans and delivery plans and so on. And then those uh, might uh, be connected to uh, performance indicators or uh, KPIs or metrics, whichever way you call them, 
uh, targets that are usually levels of performance over time, uh, whether they are expected or required, and rewards. Uh, again, they can be financial, non-financial, they can be individual, or they can be team-related, and so on. Um, the key point from um, a motivational point of view, and certainly from an alignment point of view, is that what we want to do is to really go from something that is quite aspirational and broad to something that is a bit more tangible and specific. And what is important is that those are aligned so that we create a sense of focus. Um, but to do that, we have to be consistent in what we do. And this is a key point. So if we want to use systems uh, where we collect data, we deploy data, we visualize data and report and so on, those systems have got to be connected to the wider purpose of the organization. If this is something that we do not do, we create a big tension because we may say that we are a fair employer that is very interested in providing value to its users and so on and so forth, and then the only thing that we measure is cost and efficiency. That doesn't really work. So I'm not saying that, of course, you shouldn't measure cost and efficiency and so on, but that has to be a bit more connected to the rest. Otherwise, we get a lot of frustration, a lot of confusion, cynicism, and so on. So it's very important that to start with, we establish some kind of a line. Now, um, I looked at the list of participants, and most of you guys are in Scotland. Um, from what I know, uh, from what I could see, in the public sector in Scotland, you tend to have done a lot more work than in England uh, as, uh, when it comes to outcomes. So you've done a lot of work around outcomes in the NHS, for instance. Um, the last version that I've seen of your outcome framework, although, is very abstract. It doesn't necessarily connect to the rest. It may have improved, so I apologize for that. But the version that I've seen a few months ago was quite abstract and not particularly tangible. Now, it doesn't mean that when you specify outcomes and broad uh, statements, they have to become tangible in themselves. But what we have to do is to cascade them down in a way that makes things more operational, something that we as individuals can recognize and connect to. In England, the problem is perhaps the reverse, which is there is, there's been a lot of work around strategic planning, action plans, KPIs, and so on, much less in terms of, okay, what is the impact of what we are creating for the local population, for our patients, for our students, and so on. Um, so this is the first point. If we want to motivate people through the use of the systems and um, you know, strategic plan, performance measurement systems, uh, and so on, we have to ensure that there is consistency. And as I said, that consistency comes because we internally, and perhaps externally, if we want to create alignment with external providers, for instance, or contractors, or uh, suppliers, whatever, they are established when we connect to outcomes and objectives. We, we don't create alignment because we've got common targets. We don't create alignment because we've got common measures. We create alignment because we connect to the same objective. That's, this is different. And just to make a point, um, you know, I'm going to use a couple of quotes from local government. Uh, these are real quotes, I've not made them up. Um, the first one is this. So I was talking to a program manager in a local authority, and he was telling me that you know, improving health and well-being is a key outcome for the council. And you know, many of you working for councils will recognize this as being you know, an outcome that is legitimate. You know, we, we are trying to do that. Now, as it happens, outcomes are not under our control. So this is something that we can aspire to achieve, that we would like to contribute to. But of course, health and well-being are related to all sorts of other things, from you know, social demographics to the economy and so on. The problem is that when we uh, then look at what then people do in terms of measurement, for example, if we trivialize this and we only use very simple measures, what we end up doing is that we completely lose the plot. So in this case, as you can see here, so currently it's been measured only by the number of people going to the swimming pool. And this is a problem, not just because uh, you know it's a problem because it's not just about going to the swimming pool that talks about health and well-being, but the fact is that then what we end up doing is that we forget about the outcome, which is a bit woolly and up there, and we focus only on trying to get more people to the swimming pool, which of course doesn't make much sense because then you can give you know discounts and get uh, more children to go, which is okay, but that's not the only policy that we should implement to try and improve health and well-being. So once again, we need to ensure that there is consistency and what we measure and report and so on has to be related to the objectives. But in a way that we first understand what's important and then we measure, as opposed to we measure something and therefore this becomes important. Um, so this is another quote from a director uh, of social services, I think it was, in the local authority. She was telling me, we don't measure what is valuable, we value what we measure. 
which basically says, well, you know, what is valuable to us might be the health and well-being and the economy and jobs and so on and so forth, um, but that's too difficult. So what we do is instead is just to look at what we can count. And because we can count it, that becomes valuable. So I hope you can see how this can be dysfunctional. And if we want to try to get people to be motivated towards achieving the objectives and the outcomes, which is what we are there to do, then of course we need to create that consistency, that alignment. Uh, let me show you an example. This is an example from a private company, but it can be used by anybody, frankly. And um, in this slide, which as David said, you can download, um, there is an acronym which is SPMS, that acronym stands for Strategic Performance Measurement System, uh, a measurement system of well, like a scorecard or dashboard. And essentially what this company has done is to try to connect the top and the bottom if you want. So the way it's presented shouldn't give you an idea of top down, bottom up at all. It's just graphically convenient uh, the way they deployed it this way, uh, designed it this way. But essentially what it says is that there is something to do with corporate priorities, like corporate objectives and then you can cascade targets, financial and non-financial ones, down to business units and so on, and down to individuals, and then there is another set of things that we cascade down, which are the organizational values, right? About being, again, fair, being about honest, and, and so on and so forth. And those things, again, should then feed into what gets cascaded down to an individual level. This is very important that we do this, because we need to try and have as much as possible that clarity. But we shouldn't do this in a way that is overly prescriptive, because otherwise it will feel more like a straight jacket or some kind of an imposition. What we want to do is to create a sense of direction. So a sense of direction that is both related to corporate priorities, so the corporate level SPMS, to use their terminology, but also related to the organizational values of how the, the kind of culture that we want to create, if you like. But in doing so, what we want to do is to also have a, a cascading process. So it's not just okay to have, you know, plans that match and, uh, you know, strategic plans and operational plans that are connected, but it's also the way in which we deploy this. And so my next slide is probably even more important than this one because it shows what kind of key points this company then tried to enact. So the first one was it was very important to ensure that every manager was engaged and felt responsible for the objectives, the indicators, and so on. So it's not just about cascading down and giving it to everybody, but it was ensuring that there was a sense of responsibility and accountability, so reporting and so on. That was very important. So it's not just about giving things to people, but also making sure that people feel that they own, and of course, there's a buy-in to this. Um, what is very important in the private sector, although of course it will be in the public sector too, was not to do this only through financial performance indicators, um, but also using both quantitative and quantitative, qualitative. So it is about the numbers, uh, whether it's number of people served or whether it's customer satisfaction or the efficiency of a call center, whatever, but it can also be qualitative. It can be case studies. It can be examples. It can be uh, stories around something that tell you a lot more than a, a survey of customers or users. So trying to mix a bit of the two. But keep an eye on the number of things. So you don't want to have things to explode when you've got 160 KPIs at every level, but it's more about a limited number of indicators at each level and again, going down to individuals. Again, a small set that is manageable and is actually understandable because, of course, you want to create a sense of clarity. Again, if you've got at the individual level 30 objectives, of course, you cannot tell which one is most important. So that doesn't uh, help you with clarity at all. Um, but the fourth point is really that what they tried to do was to ensure that there was sufficient trust in the relationship between management and uh, employees, so the line manager and the employee. And this is important. So if you cascade a system down and you're trying to create the sense of alignment, but at the same time trying to engage people, you need to work on that element of trust. So this is not an inspection mechanism. I mean, there may be an element of monitoring, there may be an element of control, yes, but it's very important that we try to establish that this is not just to check that people are doing what they're supposed to do, but it's, a, it's some kind of a mechanism to improve our practices. I'll come back onto that when I talk about targets. Um, the fifth point was, 
that yes, the process is to some extent top down, so we have corporate objectives and we have to detail them going down, but at the same time there has to be an element of discretion. So sometimes they left a bit of space for people to decide what level of performance they could go for, so the targets may be decided lower down, some KPIs might be introduced lower down, um, some initiatives about how to achieve those targets may be um, defined more at the local level, say a middle management level and so on. So there has to be an element of discretion. It's a bit of a fine line between, you know, trying to create something that is consistent, that you often start from the top, as it were, but at the same time leaving that space for people to understand, to get involved and so on. And then finally, you know, it is about something that is very tangible and quantitative, as I said, but also something more about, again, behaviors and so on. And that's why they try to connect both the corporate level priorities with the values and so on. So I hope this was useful. I'm, I'm happy to take questions on this at the end, but uh, it's really an example of trying to say alignment is not created only by uh, technical consistency, where you've got all the plans that click, as it were. Um, you need to follow a process where you get people to buy into this, and this is not easy, as you know. Um, so it is something that one has to manage with a bit of patience as well, and, and trying to cascade the system down and keep it fresh. Uh, one way to do this is to establish targets. So targets are levels of performance over time. It might be, I don't know, 5% cost reduction over a year, maybe improving efficiency in our processes by 10%, um, whatever it is, right? But it's usually a level of performance over time. And the thing about targets is that, you know, sometimes they work really well and sometimes they, they actually destroy value. And if you look at people that have been writing on this, I'm just giving it to you as, as an example, then I'll talk about the practice of it. But uh, if you look at stuff being written up there, I've, I've picked two quotes from at least 30 years ago, okay? So there's plenty of quotes. Uh, I've looked up uh, stuff that is fairly old just to show how much this debate has been going on and, and it's still on. Um, in various circles, like academic ones. So there's been a lot of work around what is called goal setting theory or target setting theory. And essentially these people, um, Edwin Locke, Gary Latham and many others, have been working on try to understand whether targets motivate people. And they've done experiments, they've, done, they've looked at companies, they've looked at public sector organizations, and they've seen that repeatedly, over and over again, targets tend to motivate people. It's a positive thing, um, which is a bit, to some extent may click with your experience, sometimes instead you may think, well, what about all the targets that we get in healthcare, or all the targets that we get in local councils, and how much they frustrate us because we don't understand them, because they are arbitrary, and so on. And so then you can look at other people that have been writing about target setting, um, and they would say exactly this, which is you shouldn't have targets because they're arbitrary, because they frustrate people, and so on. And if you look at the work of people like Edwards Deming, um, they wrote a famous book in the 1980s. Uh, you know, many people talking about uh, so-called systems thinking, even though it's a bit of a bastardized expression. This is not systems thinking. But anyway, so what they, what they talk about is this idea that, well, you need to understand the process and lead people, and you should eliminate slogans, targets, and so on. You should eliminate work standard quotas. You should eliminate management by numbers and everything. So it seems a bit weird. You've got on one side people that for at least 50 years have proven the value of targets, and then on the other side you've got people that say the targets are very close to being the devil. Um, so let me use a couple of examples to show when targets actually do work and when targets don't. Um, I'm going to start with one from sport, just to use a, a different uh, example, not, not, not necessarily from management. Um, I'm going to use an example from sport, I'm afraid it's not from Andy Murray, <laughs> which would be quite topical today. Uh, it's from an Italian uh, driver, so hey, more close to my home. Um, but anyway, so you may know uh, the story of this guy called Alex Zanardi, um, you may not. So the guy was a Formula One driver and then started to, well, he drove in different uh, types of races. But uh, in 2001, he had a huge accident and unfortunately, he lost both his legs. Uh, it was a tragedy, I mean, for him, obviously, for his family, for the sport as well. He was a really nice guy. and. Um, and then he went into a depression. I mean, he couldn't see, you know, what do I do now? You know, my career is in motorsport. What do I do now? And towards the end of the 2000s, he started to think that maybe he could still work in sport, but a different one. So he started to train uh, in hand cycling, uh, which, of course, is a, is a discipline in the Paralympics, which we've seen in London, in Rio recently, and so on. 
and the guy at that time was in his mid 40s so you know yeah of course uh, he could compete but uh, there were people that were 20 years uh, younger than him and uh, incredibly at the London Olympics he managed to win two golds and uh, even in Rio at the age of 49 he's just turned 50 now um, he managed to win he won again uh, he's the guy in the middle in this picture uh, the guy on the right is the is an Australian guy that actually was almost winning because he had gone much faster during the race but eventually uh, lost and what is interesting is that you know the the story of Zanardi is the the race was such that the Australian guy was going much faster than him but Zanardi kept a steady pace and here's the link with target setting so Zanardi had trained uh, with his coach and they understood that the only way they could make it um, to win the race when he was you know, much older than the other ones was to keep a steady uh, pace. And they found out that 235 watts of power was what he needed to produce. That's it. So he had to keep a steady pace. And the target functioned as uh, some kind of a regulatory mechanism was clearly set, it was based on evidence, and it was very clear that that should have been the level of performance that Zanardi had to produce over the race. He stuck to it, and eventually he did win. So, what can we get from the story in terms of target setting? Well, the first thing is that um, it is a feedback mechanism. So, it's one way of telling us whether we are achieving something or not, and whether eventually we've achieved something or not. So, that's very important. This is when targets work the best, when we have this kind of feedback mechanism. And what is important to remark is that, of course, you want to have that reference point, but you also have to have some ability, right? So there are some fundamental aspects that make targets work. The first one is this idea of ability. You have to be capable enough. So setting a target of 235 watts and then being able to produce 150, well, that's probably not very useful, right? It's just probably very frustrating for Zanardi and, and others. So we want to be able to do this. And sometimes in organizations, we want to be able to do this not just because of individual capability, but also because there is an underpinning process. There is a process that enables us to achieve that. So for example, if you want to reduce the time that it takes to recruit people and you want to speed up the recruitment process in HR, it's not just by working with one uh, member of staff in the HR uh, function, but it's trying to understand the process overall, right? So we want to try and understand that, not just the individual. The second point is that uh, specifically in organizations, we need to have an idea of where the target come from and there has to be some sense of agreement over it. So conversely, for example, if something is imposed on us with no clarity about why we are pursuing that level of performance, what is the target doing and so on, that of course wouldn't work. So we need to have a bit of a say in the process. The third point is obvious, which is, well, we need to have an opportunity. Right? So, yes, we may have a target of reducing cost by 5%, but if there is no way that I can achieve that, then what's the point? So there has to be an opportunity. And then finally, of course, we have to be motivated. So if we feel that the, the target is right and uh, we want to achieve that, then of course that triggers a lot of motivation, intrinsic and extrinsic, as I'll explain. But we have to have an element, a small element at least, of buy-in. Now. In these cases, and we can create those conditions in many cases, target setting works a lot, uh, it works really well, and it motivates people uh, quite a bit. And as I said, there is plenty of evidence over that. When it doesn't help, help is when we don't have the ability, so we're completely lost, we have no clarity, the numbers come from somewhere, but we don't know why it's 5% instead of 3% or 20%. Uh, we have no control over what goes on, and actually we think that the target shouldn't be there in the first place. So, you know, if we want those systems to help, we need to try and think as much as possible of these four elements. And if we have some clarity around those, uh, targets work very well. Um, I've left a slide for you. Uh, I cannot comment much in this, on this because we don't have time, but I left this because I know that you could download the, uh, the handouts. And this is like a little checklist for you. It's a practical checklist. So, you know, if you're trying to do the same or something different, um, you know, what kind of targets should you introduce? Uh, just briefly, uh, if you want to uh, do something better on an ongoing basis, but you know what you're doing, it's quite predictable, you should focus on what you've achieved and try to improve that. If you're trying to do something new, you should emphasize the how you're doing something and probably think more through how things are being done as opposed to just hitting the milestones on a monthly basis. Um, the type of targets I'll have to skip for now but I can go back to it if you want in the questions and answers uh, because there are different types of targets um, but the last three are more self-evident. So the first one is well if you want to ensure focus 
you need to have few targets because of course you people have selective attention if instead you want to have a broad spectrum and have people working towards many different things of course you you should broaden out um, should you change what you've had before so you've always tried to uh, improve uh, customer service by five percent every year so is this something that you should change or not well it depends if you want to reflect changes because maybe there is a difficult situation or maybe there is a, a, an easier scenario then you should change it if you want instead to capture trends and keep consistency you should probably keep the target the same and then finally targets of course are over time so it's if you use I don't know a monthly or a weekly or a, you know quarterly level you're probably more accurate if you're looking at the years of course you will be less accurate because things may change uh, but those are practical tips which as I said I'm, I'm happy to come back to um, the other bit that I want to cover uh, is really around motivation so um, again I've left some things with you to read and uh, I'm just gonna spend a bit of time on one slide and um, and then the next one and then I'll close. Uh, the first slide is very much about when this idea of extrinsic motivation works. So extrinsic motivation is this idea that we do something because we get something in exchange. Uh, as I said, it can be money, it can be uh, some form of benefits, it can be that you can go on holiday more. You know, I've seen that many times, you know, extra days. Uh, how cool is that? Um, you could also have, you know, be working on better projects, um, you can have more budget for the program you're uh, carrying out and so on and so forth. So it doesn't have to be necessarily individual uh, bonuses as it happens in some industries. It can be some kind of reward or recognition. Now if you keep that steady, so you're looking at the same type of reward, um, when it works best is when you go down the line in this table. Okay, So let me take you through these. The first one is if the only thing that you perceive is that you're doing something because you have to comply with something. So you're satisfying internal and external demand. You don't really know why this is going on, but you're basically being told that you've got to do it. Your motivation is going to be the lowest. Okay? So keeping the level of reward the same, again, money or no money, your motivation to achieve it, and therefore your, your effort and uh, your effectiveness uh, is probably going to be pretty low. It starts to become a bit more interesting and a bit, uh, you start to put probably more energy and be more motivated when you start to see also some kind of personal benefit. It may be something that, you know, improves your career prospects, maybe uh, working again with a better team and so on and so forth. So you get something in exchange, but you also give some personal benefits overall. You may uh, get even more interested in this when you feel that you're involved. So you understand why something is going on. So you get a reward, but you're actually involved in the process of understanding why you're achieving a certain level or not, why you should achieve a different level or not. And then finally, this extrinsic motivators, so again, uh, money or not money, tends to be most effective when we start to see that actually it's a good idea. It's actually a good thing to do and it's congruent with our values, something that is related to one, something that we would all do, almost do even without this kind of stimulus. So, you know, it, it's, it's funny how um, sometimes people talk about, for example, pay for performance or broad recognition schemes and uh, they, they tend to say, well, they work, they don't work. Actually, it depends. It depends how we connect to them. So we may connect to them because we believe they're what what's the underlying activity is right and therefore we do something or we may not collect, connect to them at all and therefore we feel that we're being imposed something therefore we do the minimum uh, so that we achieve we get the reward but the other point is that uh, you know we could do something because we want to and uh, you know this is an intrinsic motivation so the motivation that we can trigger through these systems is to give feedback, for example, on people on how well they're doing in relation to something that they feel that is right to do. So you may want to improve uh, the services that you provide. And getting feedback through your measurement system and so on can make you feel very, you know, much better about you. Uh, it may feel you, make you feel more competent, uh, much more capable, and, um, and also sometimes, you know, we feel that for people to be, you know, trying things out and being innovative and so on, uh, we just need to give them carte blanche, but instead it's, it's actually not that way. What measurement systems can do for us is they can give us a sense of structure, right? So, you know, we have a certain budget, for instance, we may have a certain level of service that we want to ensure, and this is very important that we measure and we connect to it, and at the same time we leave some autonomy. So we get people motivated when they have a clear sense of structure. So what is allowed, what is not, what are the broad parameters at least, but then we leave some discretion. 
and this is where, again, from a management point of view, is that kind of thin line between, you know, not not controlling too much, but at the same time not making people feel that they have no clue about what they're supposed to do. And the last bit is that there is a lot of work around this idea of shared purpose. So we tend to be best at what we do and be more motivated when we feel that we're contributing to something common. Right? So there is a sense of purpose that is shared. We are trying to benefit our patients. We are trying to benefit our local residents. And we feel that there is a shared sense of purpose within the organization. And again, if you think about what I said before about cascading, this is very important because the cascading process has to connect us to this shared sense of purpose. So if our KPIs and targets and so on are disconnected from the overall purpose, this is when the whole thing doesn't work. But if they are connected, they can be very strong and you know give us a big boost in terms of motivation. Um, if you want to read more about this, I can give you references. But uh, there is a book written by a guy called Peter Senge on the fifth discipline, it's called. There is another one by Dan Pink called Drive. Uh, I've got a reference list at the end, I'll show you, but you know, these are examples. Um, what I've done, again, because you can download the file, I've written something more as a narrative, which is what I just said. I've just left it to you with quotes. Um, the, sl the last slide that I want to cover is more around the individual performance reviews. So again, in this idea of trying to motivate people and of course avoid demotivating people, what is important is that we're trying to use tools in a way that improve what they do and develop people as opposed to making them feel too much under pressure and just being there to report for reporting's sake or sitting down with their line manager because they have to and so on and so forth. So, Again, I'm happy to share that there is an article that has just come out uh, in, in a magazine called Harvard Business Review. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that. Um, and basically it looks at the history of performance reviews. And it's interesting to see how, they use examples mainly from the private sector, but uh, it's interesting to see how over the years, you know, over the past 60 years, things have gone as a kind of swung as a pendulum from a very strong pressure towards accountability to something more around development. And we're, according to the authors, and there are some examples today, we're shifting a bit more towards development. Now, the examples that they use are very much private sector ones. Um, the public sector, you would have slightly different, uh, you know, arrangements, of course, because of the nature of the public sector overall. But uh, I think that there are some, some things that we can still connect to. So let me take you through this, uh, this table uh, going from the top down. Um, what these two guys, uh, Capelli and Tavis, talk about is the fact that, uh, you know, we, we can have performance reviews that are on the column of accountability. So reviews are there because, you know, they want to allow management to track and assess performance of employees. So checking that you've done what you were supposed to do, assessing what you've done, and this is a, a very strong kind of man monitoring mechanism. Uh, in the US, something that is very popular, unfortunately, because, you know, it doesn't work very well, is to say your forced rankings of employees. So in an office of 10 people, you know who is the best performer, who is the worst performer. Uh, you can imagine how collaborative that office is. Um, but anyway, so, so that's, you know, an extreme, if you want, a bit of an aberration of accountability. Um, but, you know, accountability is there also for a reason. It is to allocate rewards, again, financial or financial, on a more kind of sound basis, if you want, if you believe in this at least. And it is about identifying good and bad performers. So, in, you know, for promotion, for example, it will be a clearer process and so on. And at the same time, though, it requires the system to be quite structured and sometimes a bit rigid, uh, which means that the assumption is that the business environment is fairly static. The downside, of course, is that it may become too rigid, and so it becomes more like a bureaucracy and something that is related to the annual cycle, right? So you set the objectives on, say, the 1st of January, and then you have to look at the results on the 31st of December. Um, this accountability paradigm comes from the military, as you can see, probably, and it was developed before the Second World War uh, in the US and other countries, in fact. Um, but it's been adopted by lots of companies, and uh, I don't know if you read kind of management books, but uh, there has been a lot written about General Electric, GE, and what Jack Welch, the kind of uh, well-known CEO of GE, did uh, back in the days, and it was very much around this paradigm. Um, what is becoming a bit more established now is this kind of developmental aspect, which, well, we do reviews of individuals, not so much about uh, trying to check whether they're on track, but we also, and especially, we want to try and improve their performance. And 
I must say this is a disclaimer, I'm definitely more on the little mental side of things, so on the right hand column, uh, in terms of my preference, although of course there are some benefits in the accountability one as well. But what the developmental one wants to do is really to try and give feedback so people can improve in the future, as opposed to check in whether they've done things that they promised to do. And if you think about this from a motivational point of view, of course this kind of feedback, more frequent but more improvement related, is of course more interesting because you're trying to get people to improve their practice, so what they do, what they shouldn't do, as opposed to having some kind of an annual judgment, if you like. Of course the idea of ranking in this case doesn't really work because you're not trying to do that. And so you, what you want to do is also to try and get get people to be better as individuals but also as teams, right? So you're not trying to force people in some kind of distribution, but you're trying to give feedback so that people improve and they can improve again as individuals and as teams. Um, the business environment that is most suitable for this is one that is dynamic. It doesn't have to be, but if a business environment is dynamic, you require that agility. You need to give feedback more frequently, more in a developmental sense, because the objectives may become outdated. At the same time, yes, I mean, if you do this feedback cycles more often, Often you give, uh, you, you go through the loops of learning. Then, of course, it may be more time-consuming. And yes, it is a one-to-one -one exercise, you know, of uh, line manager and employee. And so, it can be a bit more subjective. It may be, uh, you know, something that, of course, the organization has to support. So, you may need to have training. You may have to have a more supportive culture of this kind of developmental approach, uh, because in a blame culture, of course, this wouldn't work. So this is the content that I wanted to cover. Uh, as I said, I tried to go through it relatively quickly because I wanted to leave uh, time for q and I've mentioned material from uh, a couple of books. Um, the, the typical execution alignment idea comes from uh, these guys. Uh, Kaplan and Norton have written quite a few books about the balance scorecard and so on. The execution premium, as the title suggests, is what that is. Um, the stuff more about motivation comes from various authors. I recommend this book called Drive, and I've also written one about measurement madness, which is instead when things go wrong, so how can we prevent things from going wrong. Um, and there's plenty more. As I said, the, the fifth discipline will be one, for example. So um, let me conclude this here. Uh, this is my email address. Uh, you're very welcome to email me if you want to receive more information, but uh, I'm also in touch, of course, with David, so I'll be very happy to send material to him. Um, having said that, I've basically covered what I wanted to cover in about 35 minutes or so, so I'd like to leave time now for Q&A. So I think that David is going to uh, facilitate that. Thank you, Pietro. Um, just uh, quickly before we start the Q&A, as we've done with previous webinars, we um, any kind of resources, etc., that Pietro has mentioned throughout the course of the webinar, if you could also just list them in the question box, and I'll liaise with Pietro following the webinar, and we can get them all gathered up. Um, and just before get any questions in, uh, just very quickly, I w just want to showcase the Change Managers Network that this webinar series is a part of. We exist mostly as a knowledge subgroup. Um, we have around 415 members now, and as you'll see from uh, here, you'll, we've got a series of webinars coming up. Our next webinar is actually a week uh, on Wednesday with Fritch Knight pre uh, presenting on systems thinking in the Environment Agency. Um, so if you want to join the network, then please feel free to do so, and uh, you will need to make a Knowledge Hub account prior to that, though. Um, oh. um, and a uh, first question's just come in. Um, I will email a link to, to, to this in the follow-up email. Um, this session was also recorded as well, so we, can set, um, so we will send that all out to everybody. Um, do we have any questions at all? Sorry, I'll just give a wee minute for them to come in, Pietro. <laughs> sure. Okay, so the first question is from uh, David Sherlock from South Ayrshire Council. Um, any thoughts on measuring the effectiveness of preventative services where attribution of activity to outcome is difficult? Right, so... Um if I understand the, the question correctly, I think that what you're trying to do is to look at what difference you make. Uh, and so, yes, it, it wouldn't be necessarily something that you do as an individual organization. I think that from that point of view, the best measurement in an ideal situation will be one that looks at what kind of effect you've had 
but not necessarily given the attribution. So you wouldn't necessarily report it back to an individual action alone. So what you could measure is the effect that has been achieved as much as possible, or what you can, uh, what you can try and do, and then maybe measuring individual contributions, but trying to give more emphasis to the results achieved. So, for example, and, and this is something that requires a lot of collaboration, not just in what you do, but also in what you measure uh, up front. So from the different organizations involved, you will need to set up, for example, KPIs that the organizations come together in, uh, maybe say, for example, process KPIs or KPIs related to individual users, um, and, and that should give you a better understanding of what has been done as opposed to just trying to fight over, well, it was my intervention that made this or it was my intervention that did that. So I think that that hopefully has answered your question, but when you're trying to look at a collaborative effort, you need to have collaborative KPIs. You need to be able to share data between different stakeholders and different organizations as much as possible so that then you have a broader picture as opposed to what we tend to do which is attribution of accountability and responsibility but then of course you leave out the most interesting bit which is you know what is it that we've created as a collective and if you want to try and create a stronger sense of collaboration you need to get together with those people that should collaborate and develop the measures in a collaborative manner so I hope that I answered the question if I haven't please re ask it again I'll try Thanks, Pietro. The next question is Crawford McIntyre uh, from Shetland Islands Council. The lock versus Dernan approach seems to be dependent on the quality of, of management. In local authorities, we have a range of management abilities, and the lock approach would seem to be easier, easier to support. What are your thoughts on that? So, did you say the lock approach? Yes, it would be easier. So, to in terms of the authors, um, so the. Let's put it this way. So the the two uh, the the quotes that are reported there are more about how different people uh, have actually talked about target setting. So for some people, the bottom part of the slide, which I can put up here, uh, as you can see it. Um, so in this case, what you've got, okay. So the bottom part here is the typical. Well, you shouldn't do any of this because this is a waste of time, and instead you should lead organizations. Whereas what the other people are saying is, actually, no, I mean, target setting do work. Now, what I believe is that, well, first of all, in the public sector, uh, target setting has become a common practice. So trying to get out of target setting entirely is probably going to be difficult. Uh, I'm not saying that all targets are good, eh? but uh, you know, trying to eliminate targets altogether, I don't think it's realistic. So if we start from that, then how do we get target setting to work? And I think that what I said in the following slide is probably a good starting point. So what we have to do is to try and use targets in a way that we motivate people, as opposed to getting people to feel that they're basically being checked, inspected, or surveilled. So the first thing is to try and have people that understand why targets are useful and you know again they are useful because they give us a sense of achievement because they give a sense of uh, you know whether we're getting somewhere or not and there is a lot of evidence of you know targets work much better than just say to people hey do your best and uh, then you'll tell me how you've done so but what we have to do uh, is really to try to to reduce as much as possible the, the use of target setting, which is negative, and which is, you know, I'm just going to give you a figure, and then you have to, it's a figure that is a bit random, I'm just going to give it to you, and then you have to make sure that you report on that on a monthly basis. So that doesn't work. So trying to work more on how people do things, try to put the numbers into context, explain why they're there, trying to get people to understand the process of setting the target and, and trying to achieve it, that works much better. And that is something that does work in any organization, you know, councils, NHS, private companies, and so on. So I hope that I have given a bit more content into that. That's very true. The next question is from uh, Marjolaine Don um, from NHS Lothian. Could you tell a bit more on how to shape KPIs looking at processes? For example, when one is man managing a project but might not necessarily be able to influence the outcome objective set, following from that, how can one ensure that an that there is enough focus on ownership of the outcomes. Yes, okay, so, so I'm just trying to, okay, so the first one is about process. Right, so we do have lots of KPIs and targets that are process related. So you talk about the NHS, so anything to do with pathways, anything to do with, uh, you know, various handovers from one specialty to another, from one trust to another, those will be all process 
uh, indicators. You can also, of course, look at process indicators in the context of projects. Um, the important thing is that, so the first one is, if you have process indicators, so again, a pathway or some sequence of activity that involves different specialisms or different units, you need to try and bring those units together. Um, the last thing that you want to do is to have a process which is instead a collection of activities. So you can be very efficient, for example, in every activity, but then be amazingly inefficient overall because the handovers are really poorly done and so on. So the first thing is to try and have an overview of the process and trying to look at how we connect the different activities. Um, in terms of ownership, well, there may be two types of ownership. One may be somebody that is an owner of the process uh, overall. So, for example, I don't know, an operations manager might be, or somebody that has got the overview of the overall sequence. And then you have more local ownership of the people involved in the activities. Now, what you do is that the person having the overview has to have that as a priority, and so do the people involved in, this, in the separate activities, even though they may also look at their own contribution. Um, let me just give you an example that is from the private sector that hopefully makes sense, but I think it's, I think it's a proper one. Um, so there is a company that makes glasses and spectacles, and um, what they realized is that they were very, it's a very integrated company, vertically integrated, so they, they basically go from you know, sourcing materials down to uh, distribution. And uh, what they were trying to do was to try and connect all those activities, as much as you would do with the patient that comes into A&E and then goes to a specialist and so on. And what they found is that they wanted to have the, the chief operating officer as the, the person that would have the overview of the time that it took what they call from click to bail. So from the moment in which you as a customer click on the uh, website to the moment in which you receive the glasses uh, at your door, so that's the bail. And to do that, they set a KPI and target for the overall process, and then they set individual monitoring systems without targets at the business unit level or the functional level. So you would have, I don't know, sourcing, procurement, you would have engineering, distribution, logistics, and so on. And you can do the same in any trust, for example. But what's important is that you have somebody that has got the overview and is the owner, the ultimate owner, if you want, but you also have people in the middle that also look at that and they constantly see their contribution to the overall process. Um, now, when you're trying to influence an outcome, but you're not directly linking to that, again, I think that you can try and look at the outcome itself, so whether, I don't know, patients are improving their health, for instance, uh, in the mid-long term also, but you can also look at your contribution to the outcome as a trust, and maybe, when it's, when it's relevant, trying to look at the specific activities. But you should definitely give more emphasis to the process. And, uh, you know, anything that is a process level, it has to be agreed and understood by all the people involved in the process. So they would have to be brought together, understand what the pathway is, for example, try to get them to understand whether a certain KPI is legitimate or not, whether they would measure in a different way, whether the target makes sense, and maybe start to get data about how the current process behaves and so on. So hopefully that answers your question. It's Pietro. The next question is Anita Ogilvy from Napier University. You mentioned different types of measure earlier in your slides, aspirational, process and threshold. Um, yep. Could you talk about, uh, talk about a, bit of, a bit more of the pros and cons of each, please? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, I apologize. I, I had to go fairly quickly because I wanted to leave time for questions. So, oh, sorry, no, it's, it's, uh, it's later on. So let me go back to the slide to, to just use it. Um, okay. So what I said, that's it. Um, the second uh, row. Right. So there are three types of targets. Um, the first one is what we call aspirational. So it's your 100% customer satisfaction, right? So it's the kind of, well, you know, it's something that is a bit up there. We don't have to hit it. it probably sometimes it's impossible to hit it, but it's important that we try and get there. You know, is uh, for example, Volvo has got the target of having no uh, fatalities uh, because of a Volvo in 2020. So it's not just people in the car; it's actually people hit by Volvos. It's an aspirational target. You never know. I mean, of course, accidents can happen, and it may be that you don't get to zero. But it's an aspiration. It's something that you're trying to get to. That target works really well when you have a learning approach. So you're trying to improve continuously. You're trying to understand what you've done, and you strive to get to the top. As 
as it were, um, it doesn't work when you've got a blame culture or a, a culture of having to tell people whether they've done something right or wrong all the time because the aspirational bit then goes out of the window. So you need to have a, a sense of development if you want. The second one is process-based. Um, those are the typical ones, So especially when there is some kind of repetitive activity. So student enrollment figures and how you know the enrollment happens at universities, uh, customer uh, like call centers and so on. You t we tend to have lots of data. It's very process-based. It's very repetitive, quite transactional. It's very easy to plot. And in those cases, we can definitely see what is the process capability, what are the causes of variation. It's typical operations management stuff. So we're trying to, uh, the target should be related to a current performance. So if our time to resolve a call in a call center is six minutes, um, we can probably try and set a target to say five minutes with some intervention. But if we said two minutes, it would be unreasonable. You probably just frustrate people. The third one is threshold. And a target phrase as a threshold is, for example, having no um, leakages in a power plant, a nuclear power plant, or no escapes from a prison, or no fatalities because of, uh, you know, in a production process uh, where we don't have uh, a, you know, health and safety regulation or whatever. So the threshold is something that we definitely want to hit or avoid. Right, so it tends to be phrased as a zero. It's a kind of binary thing, and um, those work very well when we want to put, you know, pay attention to something and make sure that everybody is very clear about it. So, you know, again, zero deaths, for example, is a very clear one. Um, now, those things require a lot of attention, and if there is an element, if there is an instance of, let's say, failure, so we don't hit the zero, but unfortunately something happens, that will be very much investigated, it will be reviewed, we will try to understand why there was, and so on. And so in some cases, the target should be phrased that way, which is, of course, different from the aspirational one. The aspirational one, if you uh, upset a customer, as it were, then it's fine as long as you're trying to improve your customer satisfaction as you go along. Uh, the threshold is instead is something that may be a catastrophe, may be very important to avoid and so on and so forth. So, but the way we phrase them and the way we use them uh, differ depending on, on situations. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, very often we use aspirational targets with a good intention and then end up treating them as a threshold. So we blame people for uh, uh, failure, which of course doesn't make sense anymore. Or, or we treat threshold ones as ones that are a bit aspirational. So if something goes wrong, well, you know, we are we're not perfect. Whereas instead, we should pay attention and try to understand why something didn't work. Thanks, Pietro. We've still got time for one or two more questions. If um, just one from myself, Pietro, you mentioned um, in in response to David's question earlier on about preventive measures, where outcomes are um, sort of monitored collaborative collaboratively by community planning partners. Do you think that yeah. those kind of collaborations to deliver and set outcomes are more uh, prone to, you know, just being part of a compliance exercise that you talked along, uh, that you talked about earlier? And um, what would, if so, what would you uh, advise to kind of get over that barrier? Um, I think that the that would be a shame. Um, I think that in many, many things that we do, particularly in the public sector, uh, we need to have a collaborative approach. So a lot of the things that we do are definitely not under the control of an organization. Um, and what we can do is to try to work collaboratively to, to improve things, whatever we do. Um, so what is important is that we, we don't take those as some kind of a tick box exercise to show that we are collaborating, but actually try to develop things in a collaborative manner. So if I go back to my little diagram of alignment, the alignment is not, in those cases perhaps, it's not so much about individual organizational alignment, but is the partnership alignment. So we want to try and have something that brings people together from different organizations, and we'll look at how we can contribute to a shared set of goals, a shared set of objectives, and so on, and trying to focus a lot on the achievement of those common goals, and then using common performance indicators, as opposed to you know having this partnership, and then everybody does their own thing. So when I talked about alignment, I tend to refer to an individual organizational alignment. Of course, uh, this is relevant also when we have partnerships. It's trickier because, of course, you're trying to get different people to come together from different organizations that will be funded differently, may have more or less of a political uh, you know, influence and so on. So, of course, you, you want to try and, and get these partners together. Um, but that requires also a very much more stakeholder-based approach to performance measurement. So you need to understand what stakeholders want uh, and can do for you, how we can contribute more together, how 
process indicators to look at another point that was raised uh, can be developed and so on. So they can be, they're probably much more the future of public sector delivery uh, and so we should probably be more in tune in terms of trying to come up with those things as a collaborative effort as opposed to individual organizations or even worse functional bits that come up with their own. Thank you very much, Pietro. Um, that's just just coming up for four o'clock, so we'll draw this session to a close. Um, I'd like to thank, on behalf of everyone who attended today, I'd like to thank Pietro for giving up his time to present. Um, it's been I've certainly found it very useful myself. And um, as as mentioned at the start of the survey, there will be a sh not at the webinar there will be a short survey following this. If you could just tell us. Um, your experience of today's webinar and also any uh, suggestions you have for improvement going forward, then that would be very much appreciated. So thanks for your attendance today and once again thanks to Pietro. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Goodbye.